Hello everybody, good afternoon and welcome to uh, what is the first live event in terms of people being in person for uh, a very, very long time. Uh, we're very, very glad that you've been able to join us. The irony, of course, is that I can't join you. Uh, that is why I'm on the screen in a recognised and familiar location. Uh, the reason is I've snapped my Achilles tendon. Uh, if that sounds painful, it's not at the moment, although uh, ask me that after I've had the operation tomorrow afternoon. I suspect that will be a bit more painful. Uh, but unfortunately, because I've got to go into hospital, I've got to self-isolate after a PCR test. And so I can't join you, which is absolutely gutting, frankly, uh, after you arrange this event specifically to be an in-person event. Luckily, though, you can see there that we are uh, we have presence uh, in the room. Um, familiar faces to you all, I'm sure. First of all, Thea Osmond Smith and, uh, and secondly, James Corbett Bircher both of whom uh, you will know as particularly able and successful junior barristers in our chambers, both of whom I suspect will eventually just eat up my entire practice. Um, the, the reality is that uh, we want to cover this topic quickly and move to the issues that you've all come to listen to, which is um, how to make a very special circumstance case. Just to explain briefly how we divide that up, I'm going to start and talk for about 20 minutes on the general principles and then some of the cases that have emerged over uh, the last couple of years. Um, and then Thea is going to take over and talk about two of the most recent cases, which slightly reset the compass in terms of the basis upon which we can now make very special circumstances cases. And then because it's not always about housing, uh, it's often about uh, e economic development and employment development, James will be focusing his attention on uh, how to make a very special circumstance case for economic development. So without uh, taking any more time by way of introduction, I'm going to start and uh, we've got some notes uh, which everybody can have uh, available to them if they wish, or we can send those to you. Um, what you want to know, I suspect more than anything else is um, how to make a very special circumstance case for your clients or yourselves in circumstances where you've got a greenfield site in a good location. Um, it hasn't been allocated for development or the council aren't making progress with the plan. So should you run an application speculatively in the greenbelt? Well, there are a number of things to look out for and a number of factors, and that's what we're going to try and help you with, whether that field is the right site to take a speculative application with. For much of the past decade, since the Conservative Party came to power in 2010, there's been very little appetite to progress applications for major development in the Greenbelt. Protecting the Greenbelt was a key part of the Conservatives' general election campaign in 2010, as was the desire to abolish the regional spatial strategies, which sought to address housing need at a strategic level, where Greenbelt was often being questioned. What happened in 2010 was, as we know, the Conservatives failed to win a majority and up until Boris Johnson's general election victory, they limped through the decade in a series of coalition, minority and wafer-thin majority governments. And the consequence of that for planning is that the Conservatives had to talk tough about protecting the Greenbelt. There was therefore no encouragement from the government for bringing forward housing proposals in the Greenbelt even when a local planning authority had no up-to-date housing uh, uh, supply and no up-to-date local plan, and usually in absence of a five-year supply. So despite those factors, uh, no encouragement from government. Uh, it might have been seen as a way of progressing plans if councils thought they were going to lose applications or have to grant applications and lose appeals in the Greenbelt. But ministers uh, were in fact operating uh, in quite the reverse. Ministers were falling over themselves to say how much the Greenbelt would be protected. These uh, were often generalised statements, uh, which did not mention very special circumstances. But in 2013, we saw Brandon Lewis make a written ministerial statement, making clear that housing need on its own would, and I quote, not normally amount to very special circumstances. That statement was issued in the context of concern about unauthorised travellers in the Greenbelt, but there was a very subtle reference in there to conventional housing as well. Now, I'll just read out the quote because it's probably the most important thing uh, I need to say, which is uh, the statement made clear. The Secretary of State wishes to make clear that in considering planning applications, although each case will depend on its facts, he considers that the 
single issue of unmet demand, whether for travellers' sites or for conventional housing, is unlikely to outweigh harm to the Greenbelt and other harm to constitute the very special circumstances justifying appropriate development in the Greenbelt. So the addition of those words there, or for conventional housing, meant that this was a clear statement that the government was not willing to allow housing need, however severe and how acute that need might be, to equate to very special circumstances. Now, that's plainly right, because to allow unmet housing need on its own to equate to very special circumstances would drive a coach and horses through Greenbelt protection. That's because there's so much unmet housing need in this country, especially in Greenbelt areas, that most speculative planning applications for development would therefore have to be granted. And clearly the government didn't want that and doesn't want that. Now, that statement by Brandon Lewis um, led to a marked reluctance by the development industry to progress schemes in the Greenbelt on a speculative basis for the best part of a decade, um, as did some high profile refusals for permission at the start of that period um, on sites in the Greenbelt, despite significant shortfalls in local planning authority five year supply. Secretary of State decisions where refusals took place on greenfield sites included in Bath, two sites promoted by uh, Anthony Crean, Nuneaton, uh, a site promoted by Jerry Carhill, recommended for approval by the inspector, and Castle Point in Essex, promoted by um, Peter Goatley on behalf of Gladman, where the council had about a one-year supply of housing. And um, that really was the low point in terms of um, the Secretary of State making clear that nothing would lead to the development of sites in the Greenbelt on a purely housing need basis. Now, housing need on its own is potentially capable of amounting to exceptional circumstances. That was explained, albeit not perhaps as clearly as it might be, by Mr Justice Oosley in the case of Compton Parish Council and Guildford Borough Council. I've included in the notes a quote there, but if you read it very carefully, paragraph 72 and 73, there is enough there to say that housing need on its own can amount to exceptional circumstances for releasing land from the Greenbelt in the context of local plans. And those of you involved in the Solihull local plan at the moment, of course, will be very familiar with that. I hope to be there next week, plaster on foot uh, allowing. Um, but it's important to bear in mind that the Court of Appeal has made clear that that test, the local plan exceptional circumstance test, is a lower threshold than the very special circumstance test. And this was made clear in a case called uh, Luton Borough Council against Central Bedfordshire Borough Council and Houghton Regis Development Corporation. And in there, very helpfully, Mr. Uh, the, the court made clear that it was a stricter test, helpfully in the sense that it, it tells us that you need more than housing need, but um, unhelpful in the sense that it makes clear it is a very high hurdle. So what does amount to very special circumstances? Well, it's going to be a range of factors. It will never be one on its own. And it's about a balancing exercise, which Thea will talk about a bit later on in terms of what is on the other side of the balance. But in terms of the very special circumstances, which are effectively a collection of material considerations in favour of the proposal, um, the shortfall in the five-year housing land supply and the no doubt, unmet need for affordable housing will not be sufficient on their own. That is absolutely clear from um, what is said by the ministers in the ministerial statements and all the decisions that we've looked at. So you need more. And that's really what this seminar is about. As far as the housing is concerned, as I say, James will talk about employment. Now, in the last two to three years, that apathy or lack of appetite to pursue sites in the Greenbelt has waned and a number of developers have pursued them uh, as speculative applications. And in that period, a number of inspectors have allowed appeals in various forms for residential development and extra care accommodation in the Greenbelt, finding that very special circumstances do exist. Now, that's either through their own decisions or a recommendation from the Secretary of State. But lest I forget, one of the most important things to observe is that actually an a significant number of cases are not getting recovered by the sector state. Um, and that's very, very significant. When I started my career about 20 years ago, I remember doing an appeal for Bromsgrove for an individual house in the Greenbelt in Bromsgrove near, um, near Alvechurch. 
And that was the appetite at the time to, to deal with individual houses, whether that's a call-in or recovery, at ministerial level. That has significantly changed. And a lot of the decisions I'm just going to mention now briefly are cases in which there has been no recovery or call-in by the Secretary of State, meaning that the prospects of success are surely enhanced because the inspectors are not concerned with making the political decisions that ministers are. First decision then, uh, West Malling, uh, proposal by retirement villagers. Now, retirement villages, uh, along with a number of extra care operators, has been taken over by large insurance companies. AXA Insurance bought retirement villages and pursued an appeal on a Greenbelt site on the edge of West Malling in Kent. It was for 80 extra care retirement apartments and cottages on a Greenfield site. It was heard in 2019 by Inspector Robert Meller. Um, And he issued his decision within two weeks. Quite rightly, he attached substantial weight to the harm to the green belt, as well as harm by reason of inappropriateness. But he found visual and spatial harm to openness and harm derived from encroachment in the countryside as well. But what he then did, having accepted all that harm, is accept the harm to openness and encroachment was mitigated by the site's visual containment. Always a relevant factor, uh, I think, in green belt cases. And in mind, uh, in light of um, the unmet housing need for elderly accommodation um, and a complete absence, actually, of any extra care in the entire district, he gave that very significant weight. So, too, uh, to the freeing up of family housing for um, younger people, um, because a lot of elderly people, uh, we all know our parents occupy some of them, are in uh, houses that are over uh, under occupied and therefore over providing for their needs so the extra care he saw would free up family housing and he included that in the very special circumstances as to the public benefits and health benefits of people moving into more appropriate accommodation and overall he allowed the appeal now what's important to say is the site was actually a draft allocation in the emerging local plan and although the inspector placed limited weight on that because it hadn't been subject to examination. I personally think that the inspector will have taken a great deal of comfort from the fact that this site had been identified by the council uh, as an appropriate site in the emerging plan. As it happens, the plan failed at the EIP stage. So the developers have done the right thing to go early and release the site um, despite the local plan process. But the draft allocation was undoubtedly helpful. Another case uh, on metropolitan open land in London, which has the same status as Greenbelt, was a station approach Lower Sydenham in Bromley. And um, that uh, that site involved apartment buildings, which ranged from nine storeys to four storeys. It was designed by the leading world architect, Ian Ritchie. He's the architect who designed the pyramids outside the Louvre. Inspector George Baird found exceptional quality from the development. Um, But the critical thing is that the developed part of the site with these tower blocks on was a brownfield site. It was an old um, works uh, sports centre. And the greenfield part of the site was to be retained in as open land, but developed as a as a pocket park or a bit bigger than that, a a sort of uh, one acre park. And because that was then open to the public when the land previously wasn't, the inspector thought that was also a beneficial factor. It was also right next to a railway station, um, 20 minutes from Tower Bridge Station in London. And um, it provided this new public park, all of which amounted to very special circumstances. Next case, Great Broughton in Cheshire, very similar to the first one, extra care brought by Castle Oak Care Development. Now, crucial here, they copied a lot of the evidence from the West Malling case, but this was a partial brownfield site. So Inspector uh, Lee recognised that um, the, the site could accommodate development partly because of the existing brownfield development and partly because of the case for extra care need. Fourth case, Borough Bridge Road in York, an appeal made by Miller Homes for 266 new dwellings on a pure greenfield site. Uh, It was allowed by Inspector Yvonne Wright. Um, She treated the site as Greenbelt, despite the fact that there is no inner boundary that's yet defined for York, because amazingly, even older than St Albans, which uh, Thea's going to talk about, York has never had a local plan. Uh, Now, I advised on that site. The site was a proposed allocation in the draft neighbourhood plan. 
This allocation was deleted in the final version of the neighbourhood plan, so the inspector attached no weight to it. But more significantly, the site was identified as a housing allocation in the emerging local plan, which is obviously advantageous. The local plan inspectors hadn't reported, and unsurprisingly, the inspector um, gave the actual allocation limited weight. But again, it was a crucial factor for that appeal inspector to know that this was a site favoured by the council in the emerging local plan. Uh, the next site uh, is uh, Burley and Wharfdale, which is uh, a larger scheme, 500 houses on a greenfield site on the edge of uh, Burley and Wharfdale in Bradford District. It's a large sustainable village, 7,000 people. It was a call in inquiry because uh, the local authority actually supported it, but the local MP was against it. Um, and it was actually refused, despite the officer, uh, despite the inspector's recommendation to approve. Um, but so the uh, CEG, who developed, uh, who were the developers, actually um, quashed the decision in the High Court, um, highlighting that the decision was unlawful. It then went back, and in March last year, it was redetermined and um, redetermined favourably by the Secretary of State. By that stage, though, the council had identified 700 houses for Burley and Wharfdale, of which 500 needed to be on a greenfield site, and the council favoured this site. That's why they supported it and why it was a call-in. So that was granted by the Secretary of State. Again, what we see is a site that has effectively been identified by the local planning authority, then being favoured um, by the Secretary of State. Cheadle Hume in Stockport, the sixth case. Uh, that's uh, Stockport near Manchester. And uh, this was a proposal for housing, but it's a bit of an unusual one in the sense that the proposal involved a school site and um, a large part of the scheme was allowing the school to expand. It was a school for children with complex and multiple special needs. So there was a strong moral dimension to the need case as well. The houses were cross subsidising the redevelopment of the special school and um, there was an enabling development as well. So the Secretary of State um, relied on the fact there was a lack of five-year land supply in Stockport. You'll probably know Stockport, uh, not easy to secure development there. They bowed out of the um, Greater Manchester uh, Spatial Framework, the only authority of the 10 in Manchester to do so. So this was a particularly good uh, success for Paul Tucker, my friend at uh, King's Chambers. Um, the, the school was undoubtedly, though, a crucial factor in this case. Um, Finally then, Oxford Brooks University Wheatley Campus. I think we have Rob Gardner from uh, Avison Young joining us uh, uh, in the meeting today. This was Rob's application. Uh, he pursued this on behalf of the uh, Oxford Brooks University, who were not willing to await the psychodrama that was the adoption of the um, South Oxfordshire plan. Um, and so the university, to ensure it could pursue its uh, funding aspirations, wanted to sell Wheatley Campus for housing and focus its attention on its urban sites. This site is about three miles out of Oxford. Um, there's a large 10 storey tower there. Quite a few planners know this and some have even uh, stayed on that campus site because of the planning course they do at Oxford Brooks. The campus supported the education and provided accommodation for thousands of students, but it stood surplus to requirements and the university's new development plans. And uh, a multidisciplinary team took several years to develop a residential scheme um, headed up by Rob um, for 500 units. Now, part of the site was brownfield because of the buildings, but that was extended in, uh, in Rob's submission um, on the basis that the playing fields, which were extensive, should form part of the curtilage and therefore be seen as part of um, the brownfield area. And if you did that, that took a largely greenfield site and turned it into 85% PDL. Well, um, the local authority refused this. The appeal um, was progressed uh, and was recovered by the Secretary of State. The inspector, uh, Dominic Young, no relation, accepted that argument on the curtilage. Uh, he took the view, it wasn't like a curtilage around a house, it was a curtilage around a campus and the university playing fields were part of that campus and part of the curtilage. So he did treat 85% of the site as previously developed land. And uh, the council were arguing for just 300 houses on, on what they thought was the legitimate brownfield part of the site. 
but the inspector disagreed, granted planning permission, and this is the largest contentious greenfield site to ever have been granted planning permission. Um, all others tend to be sites that are favoured by the council. Um, in Greenbelt terms, the Secretary of State focused a lot on paragraph 145G of what was then the MPPF in the 2018 version. Um, and that has been written really to help sites like this come forward where there is an element of PDL, not necessarily all of the site. And also the proposal will deliver affordable housing and potentially improve um, visibility, uh, improve amenity and landscape impact, which undoubtedly the removal of the 10 storey tower did, although that didn't stop Michelle Bolger trying to argue um, that wasn't really a benefit. So um, there's a series of cases there before we come to the most recent ones. I just want to highlight in the final couple of minutes, what are the key factors there? Because there's a series of disparate examples and you may think, well, what do we take from that? I would say there are um, uh, about seven key factors that you can take from this about which sites to promote. The first and by far the most important up until now, at least, and through these cases, is that First of all, it is highly beneficial if the site is a draft allocation in an emerging local plan. That was the case when the Secretary of State granted permission for Brockworth in Gloucester back in 2015. That was a site for 1,500 homes, but a large draft allocation in the joint core strategy for Cheltenham, Tewkesbury and Gloucester. Um, it was a feature in these more recent cases in the York Appeal, um, and also at uh, Wheatley Campus, where it was a draft allocation and West Malling. So that is undoubtedly a feature in respect of um, how to get a very special circumstance case home if you've got a site that is a draft allocation. Secondly, uh, I would say the second most significant factor is if you're seeking permission on a site which is at least in part previously developed land. That ties in with the guidance in the MPPF um, and is evident in the Bromley, the Wheatley and the Chester appeal decisions. Those are the two main factors, but other factors that undoubtedly help. Well, certainly if the council accepts there's a need for Greenbelt release on Greenfield land, that was the case in the Bradford, Bromley and Stockport cases. It was also a feature of an appeal that Paul Cairns uh, of these chambers did at Ruddington in Nottingham, where the council accepted the need for Greenfield development in the Greenbelt at Ruddington, a village uh, just south of uh, Nottingham, um, although the council's preferred allocation was actually another site. Fourth factor even though it's not enough on its own, the existence of unmet housing need uh, and including a lack of five-year land supply plainly will assist the case. I've often put to witnesses for the council that um, that can be about as, as much as 80% of your very special circumstances if there's a really good case on unmet housing need. And that was a feature in Bromley, West Malling, York, Bradford and Stockport. Fifth point, it helps if the site is visually contained, which was a feature found by the inspectors in West Malling, Wheatley and Bromley. Um, and it also helps if you're supporting or enhancing education facilities, as was the case in the Stockport and the Wheatley cases. Um, and then finally, I would suggest that other factors that can be of assistance are clearly close proximity to a railway station, as in the Bromley case, um, and where there's uh, an appropriate need for elderly housing, such as West Malling and Cheshire, or indeed exceptional architecture and the provision of publicly accessible open space, such as in the Bromley case. Um, and as I say, those are all factors that assist, the most significant of which undoubtedly being a draft allocation. Now that was, that was the state of play up until very recently, but there've been two important developments and I'm gonna hand over to Thea now. The housing land supply deficits alone can ever be sufficient to justify development uh, for new housing in the Greenbelt. Now, Chris has kind of given the game away a little bit on this, but for those of you that have been keeping up to date with recent Greenbelt decisions, let's see if there's a difference. By a show of hands, who thinks that housing need alone can amount to very special circumstances in proposals for housing development in the Greenbelt? Do we have any super optimists in the audience? No, you're a shrewd brunch. OK, so you don't think that's the case. Well, we'll come and have a look a bit at that question um, through the appeal decisions I'm going to talk to you about. And in some ways, the question is a little bit unfair 
and the basis of it wrong, because very special circumstances, you'll remember from the framework test, do not exist unless the potential harm to the green belt by reason of inappropriateness and any other harm arising from the proposal is clearly outweighed by other considerations. So very special circumstances is about a balance, not just a particular factor or benefit. And the level of harm arising from a particular site is as important as the benefits on the other side of the balance. Because if you start with a high level of harm, the, the benefits that you're going to have to demonstrate, those other material considerations to overcome that harm, are of course going to have to be much greater. So it draws in benefits and harms, and it's important when considering promoting a site in the green belt to begin with that site selection process to make sure you've got a site that has limited impacts in the first place, not just in green belt terms, but in all terms, because if you've got green belt harm and then you're going to lump in a bit of heritage harm, a bit of landscape, a bit of ecology, of course, it's a tall order to outweigh that just with um, a housing need alone. So pick sites where there are problems with the plan led system, where the plan isn't delivering sufficient housing, perhaps where it hasn't been reviewed in five years or more, where it's painfully old and out of date, as we're going to see in one of the examples that we come to, or where it doesn't exist in York. Um, or perhaps, as Chris has said, where, where you're in emerging allocation. So you can, you, you've already got that evidence base that supports your site, the council is supporting you, perhaps members are supporting you, officers have given a view, the evidence base is helpful. And that's all compelling stuff that you can put before an inspector. And then think carefully about the benefits. What is your site bringing to the party? Is it just housing? There's an enormous deficit in market and affordable housing that you can help remedy. Well, that's something that you need to tell the inspector about for sure. Are there gold star benefits of your scheme that set it apart from other green belt sites? Because as Chris has said, the question that you might face is if your site's appropriate just on the basis of housing need and the benefits that you bring about through providing market and affordable housing, why shouldn't any site in the green belt be allowed? And plainly given the policy protection to do with green belt, that's going to be really important for you to set your site apart. Now, as Chris has said, in 2013, also 2015, ministers made clear that unmet housing <coughs> need alone would not normally be considered sufficient to prove very special circumstances. But two recent decisions have faced that question head on or that statement head on. And we're going to spend a bit of time on those looking at how they dealt with it. So the first is the Colney Heath decision. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware of that, a proposal for 100 dwellings on a site straddling the boundary between St Albans City and District and Welland Hatfield Borough. And that got permission following an appeal in June of this year. It was one that Chris had advised on originally and advised the client to go to appeal uh, and to up the affordable housing contribution. But then, unfortunately, it couldn't do the uh, appeal because of a clash with another inquiry. The second we're going to have a look at, and these are both in your notes, the references and the, the facts that I'm going to pull out to assist us in this discussion. Uh, the second is Codicot, and that's proposals for 167 dwellings that were granted permission in September, again, following an inquiry. And that's the one where I'm going to start because that's perhaps a more straightforward, traditional green belt case. Um, that was a site that was bound by existing dwellings, the church, a primary school, 40% of the site was proposed to be kept open. And the harm to openness was considered by the inspector to be in the range of moderate to significant. Now, in terms of encroachment into the countryside, and you'll know why that's important, because it's one of the purpose, is purposes of the Greenbelt to prevent encroachment. The, the inspector found that given the immediate relationship with the village, the harm would be moderate. And that was something that was consistent with the council's evidence base for the emerging plan, which had already found that there were exceptional circumstances for Greenbelt really. So a big tick in the box for the site promoters there. Now, the emerging local plan was uh, and is at an advanced stage, and the appeal site was proposed for housing development in it. Again, big tick for the promoters there, because that's a really good position to be in, isn't it? If you think about when you go to a Section 78 appeal, the local authority are in the examination room telling the local plan examiner that this is a good site, that they support it, they want it to go ahead, it's, it's sound. And then they're in the inquiry room saying to this inspector that they don't want it. Frankly, that 
uh, makes for oodles of fun in cross-examination. Um, and it's an uncomfortable position for a local authority to be in. Now, the council in that appeal did take an issue on prematurity, but there was no evidence that the local plan inspector had concerns about the site, the draft allocation, and the council had supported it throughout and continued to do so at the time of the inquiry. So while this wasn't an overriding factor in the inspector's judgment, as Chris said, undoubtedly it would have provided some comfort when assessing this site that the council thought that this was a sound allocation that should come forward for housing. In terms of housing need, there was a 1.47 year supply. Ouch, that's, that's tricky, isn't it? When you get down into the, the one year, that's, that's pretty serious. I mean, it's serious to think when you get to two or three, but one sounds particularly bad. And there were over 2,000 applications for general needs affordable housing and a waiting time of nearly five years for a two bedroom flat. So you can begin to see a picture emerged of how this evidence was put as to just how desperate the housing need was. No affordable housing had been delivered in that settlement in 14 years and a policy compliant level of 40% affordable housing was offered as part of the scheme. So do, do we need to go further? Who would be giving permission for this site on the basis of what we've heard so far? It's pretty compelling stuff. Well, the appellant did go further and offered playing pitches for the adjacent school, which was in desperate need of expansion with no apparent way of doing so. The need was described by the inspector as urgent because the school had no other option than to start using up its own playing fields in order to expand. And the pupils were having to travel out to different schools. That was regarded as unsustainable patterns of travel and also uh, bad for children's welfare. So again, you can see how this evidence began to emerge and the points that the appellants were making on it. So the inspector said uh, that the provision of the lands for the school was a clear and important benefit that should be afforded significant weight, not just in its own terms, but because it would help unlock uh, other emerging allocations who would be relying on the provision of additional school places in due course. So the inspector referred to an immediate imperative both for people to be housed in the settlement and also for children to be educated in the settlement and those were the factors that ultimately won the day for the appellant. Now it's worth mentioning that there were other harms here because this was an appeal where the inspector found less than substantial harm to listed buildings and also a registered park and garden. And that's something that's generally worth being nervous about at a section 78 appeal because of the presumption that that creates against the grant of planning permission. So we've got two pretty solid uh, policy presumptions here. Greenbelt, no. Uh, heritage harm, no. But in the context of the emerging plan where the council had obviously already assessed these matters, and consider that the allocation nonetheless should be regarded as sound, it, it seemed to give the inspector uh, the tools that he needed to dismiss that issue quickly. And the heritage harm was, um, was found to be um, outweighed by the public benefits, namely the provision of housing and also the additional land for the school. So it's a helpful decision in that sense because it, it's a decision where heritage impacts were found Greenbelt site and nonetheless those benefits were sufficient in both instances to outweigh the harm. So returning to the very special circumstances balance in this case, the inspector did record that the circumstances of the application were extreme and that the housing benefits and education benefits were sufficient to outweigh that green belt and other harms such that there were very special circumstances and on that basis found that the proposals accorded with the development plan. So that's that decision. Moving on to Colney Heath, and, and the reason I left this one to last is because it's more unusual. Uh, the site was not proposed for allocation in an emerging plan. There was no offer of land for a new school uh, or some other site-specific goodie. Um, it wasn't previously developed, but the context for this was that the St Albans local plan which identified the extent of Greenbelt had been adopted in 1994 and that made that the oldest local plan in the country. And that's that's quite a nice opening, isn't it, for an appellant and an inquiry, that we are dealing here with the oldest local plan in the country. Uh, the inspector found that the considerable reduction in openness would carry substantial weight against the proposal, but that the proposals, because of their context, that is the context uh, and their immediate relationship with the settlement, would not result in any harm to the encroachment of the Greenbelt. So that's a good result in terms of that purpose of the Greenbelt. 
Now, interestingly here, the parties had agreed less than substantial harm to a single listed building. The inspector took that and disagreed and said, actually, there is no harm. So a really unusual result, but certainly a, a good one for the appellant in that case. Respect to affordable housing, that achieved very substantial weight because there was a shortfall of around 4,000 dwellings in each district. So a huge magnitude of unmet need and an additional level of affordable housing was offered here, I think probably in the region of 10%, but actually it's not something that the decision majors on in terms of the additional affordable housing offer, because the position is so bad, uh, I think any affordable housing would be welcome. So paragraph 47, the inspector noted the previous ministerial statement that Chris took you to, but said this, it's not been incorporated into the framework. Similar guidance has been removed from the PPG, and so it's a material consideration that achieves only little weight in the balance. The inspector at Codicott came to a similar view in footnote 16, but not in such stark terms as that. So again, that's something that you can draw on, draw on because inevitably that's an argument that local authorities will want to rely on when resisting uh, housing schemes within the green belt. So very special circumstances existed here because of the benefit of housing. Uh, but it should be noted that the harm that had to be outweighed was obviously relatively modest. So yes, only housing, well, in a pretty poor planning context, the oldest plan in the country, um, but a modest level of harm to start with. So it is an unusual decision, uh, but this was obviously a good site, a straightforward inspector and a fertile planning context. So I think while it would be a mistake to treat this exception as a new rule, it's certainly a step in the right direction as to how we should be viewing suitable greenbelt in the context of suitable greenbelt sites promoted for housing development in the context of overwhelming housing need. Now, there are a couple of other decisions this year, and I've put those in your notes for today. One is Forkham, that was for 26 homes, and there's also Roman Road Brentwood, 110 homes promoted in the greenbelt by Red Row. And what we see there is further examples of factors combining to make very special circumstances because in both places it was more than just about the housing. We had uh, a, a past permission, so a pretty hefty fallback on one site um, of a care home that would have had a greater impact on the green belt and also previously developed land. So it's still important to consider all of those factors that we've addressed that Chris has touched on and think about how you can enhance the offer of your scheme over and above just the benefit of housing. So a few tips on that, just to build upon what Chris has said, an easy way of doing that is by enhancing your affordable housing offer, offer, if it's viable to do so, of course. But you have to start by knowing what the need is in both the district and also preferably your settlement, because you can see how you can make a compelling argument. If there's been no affordable housing in your settlement for years and years and years, why that's something that needs to be addressed immediately. Are the compelling arguments in terms of the waiting list? How many people are on the waiting list and how long are they having to wait? What are the prospects of a solution being found by the local authority to that housing problem? Are there affordable housing sites in the pipeline in that particular settlement? Do the work and get the evidence on it and don't underestimate how useful it is to have a particular witness dealing solely with the affordable housing need because it's really easy, isn't it, to turn up to an inquiry and for everyone to say, well, there's an affordable housing need and we give significant weight to it and then move on. But you need to spend some time drilling down into the numbers and making sure that the inspector understands the position, the severity of it, and why it's so important that that affordable housing is delivered. Think about the same as well with other specialists' uh, housing needs, as we saw in, in the last case with the, the self build housing that was provided. The framework regards the ability of green belts to offer public access and provide opportunity for outdoor sports and recreation as important, see paragraph 145. Is that something you can offer? Can you make uh, part of your site that was previously unavailable for public access open to the public and thereby uh, enhance the public's use of it? What does the community need? Land for education, land for sports. Can you bring about some other wider community benefit either on your site or by the offer of land elsewhere in the same settlement? Look at the neighbourhood plan, look at the village newsletter, what, what are people concerned about? Do that in advance, put the homework in and make sure that the offer is attractive. 
Landscaping, that's going to assist in mitigating the visual impacts of the scheme and perhaps prevent the scheme from being regarded as encroaching too far into the countryside. Is your site well enclosed? Can it be made to be well enclosed? So these are all important things to think about, despite Colney Heath. Uh, it's still going to be difficult, in my view, to establish very special circumstances just because of a housing land supply deficit in most cases. And with that, I shall pass it on to James. Very much there. I've got the paper hand off one. This is it. This is all we get from government. A couple of paragraphs referring obviously to the VSC test. Text look extremely sparse. And when we look at the economic paragraphs as well, 81 and 83 in the new version. Again, we look at this and say, is this it? Is this it from government? It's a masterpiece of creative ambiguity. And the interrelationship of these provisions with all of the abundant data that we get, the papers, guidance from Treasury and the rest of it, utterly unclear from the face of the MPPF. So how do we navigate these waters with so few way markers? We need to start with two principles, which I will come back to again and again through this short presentation. Paragraph four, get your structure of your VSC case, your other considerations case, really clear and focused at the start. Don't run a 17-point VSC case. Get four to five good, clear headings, job creation, economic growth, innovation, reduction of emissions. Get those straight at the start. And then secondly, once you've got that structure in place, pack in the detail behind each of those headings. A couple of points about the case law, which I've set out from paragraph six onwards. You will not find an answer to the VSC test in the court judgments, but you will find a few hints. You will find some provisions, as it were, that certainly should be thought about in terms of structuring some kind of legal basis to your case. It will also divert you from pitfalls. I've set them out uh, from paragraph seven onwards. Which in 2008, the claimant in that case said the term very special could only be the converse of commonplace. No, said the court. It's a qualitative judgment. Secondly, combination of factors drawn from the Basildon case. The claimant in that case said that every single BSC other consideration had to be very special in its own right. No, again, said the court. A number of factors have underlined when considered in isolation, may, when combined together, amount to very special circumstances. And there's no reason why that number of factors, ordinary in themselves, cannot combine to create something very special. But thirdly, then, rigor, a per temps, have I pronounced that right there? That's what case, uh, my colleague to my left, Limblom. Uh, or Justice Limbaugh in that case, uh, setting out the rigour that's required in respect of a VSC case. Again, this goes back to the principle of having clear, simple pillars, clearly defined routes through this to assist the inspector. Fourth, obviously, as we all know now from the Red Hill Aerodrome case, the VSCs must be capable of outweighing all of the harm. And that's a very important principle in identifying that one of your VSCs cannot simply be the absence of harm. That in itself isn't extra. That won't get you home at all. That needs to be scratched and moved to other elements of the planning balance. And fifth, greater than exceptional circumstances, and I refer that to the Compton case, it's obviously a local plan challenge, uh, but in that case, confirmation, the exceptional circumstances test is less demanding than very special circumstances. But nonetheless, we get some very interesting and familiar principles set out by Sir Duncan Easley in that case, I've cited paragraph 72, that exceptional circumstances not limited to some unusual form of housing or to a particular intensity of need. And applying that principle up to the VSC case, it's not some unusual form of employment development or a particular intensity of jobs within a particular area, but it may simply be ordinary jobs 
up with additional factors that you can combine together to set this out as being a BSC case. So in practice, we then go into the appeal decisions. Obviously, we know that need and the absence of alternative sites, they're going to be essential, essentially, in any case. At least a very strong engagement with the alternatives principle. Uh, and finally, if you want to run an environmental benefits component to this to your case, make sure you can, so far as possible, directly relate it back to the green greenbelt harm. So if you want to provide landscape, if you want to provide an open space, make clear exactly how that's going to address issues of openness. For example, in thinking about the configuration of the site. So we turn then to what I'm going to describe as the early years of the MPPF, uh, 2012 to 2018, that's a six-year period up until we got the revised MPPF. We've heard about the written ministerial statement. Of course, there was no similar provision for employment and economic development. And so in this uh, policy vacuum, uh, and the uncertainty that arose from that, there were still some big cases that got through that were successful. One of them was one I was fortunately involved in, with Martin Kingston, that's Pinewood Studios, paragraph 13. And you can see there cited below that paragraph the clarity of the case which Martin builds for Pinewood in that case, delivering sustainable economic growth for world-leading business in a priority sector, the absence of a credible and viable alternative, query now whether that's a VSC in its own right or something which one simply has afterwards as an additional material consideration. Thirdly, the range and scale of the socioeconomic economic benefits, and fourthly, the harm to that business and the creative industry sector as a whole that would arise from the rejection of that appeal proposal. Now, obviously, that is an exceptional proposal. In building that, we essentially secured the future of James Bond in Star Wars in this country. But there are principles within that very long decision which could be operated for any sector, manufacturing, logistics, any special form of employment. And as I set out, we can see these now being explored in later decisions. I've also referred to the Strategic Rail Freight Interchange back in 2014, and briefly the Perrybrook case, which, whilst predominantly a housing case, uh, saw the, the Secretary of State affording considerable weight to the economic benefits in that case. So we get to 2018, and as we've heard, a number of applications being promoted. They were working their way through the system and unfortunately getting refused at first instance or being given a resolution to grant, but finding themselves caught up in the call-in process. The case study I want to use to explore some of these points is the case of Denby Hall. This is a case uh, to appeal to the this year. I acted for the appellant in that case. And uh, it is uh, in respect of, as we see in the setup there, an extension of a business park for three large B1, B2, B8, at factory units. I'll set up the facts and then I will also just come back after this to the recent logistics call the decisions. Obviously those supported by the local authorities. Denby Hall is an example of no allocation in the local plan of a local authority opposition up to the appeal itself. And therefore I think it's a useful case study for those cases where you just simply can't get the authority on side. But the facts from paragraph 17 onwards, we have an established business park adjacent to the Greenbelt. There have been Greenbelt releases to enable that park to expand, but unfortunately the politics got in the way. Local members were unprepared to grant permission for employment development, notwithstanding the obvious benefits locally, because they got this wrapped up in the question of housing and their concerns about their local plan. At Amber Valley, the authority, hadn't updated its local plan since 2006, and it got as far as essentially a very advanced draft local plan, which they then withdrawn. So uh, ostensibly we have here uh, some considerable local opposition and effectively no clear route for a local plan to be put in place to essentially replace that. And what we effectively had was an early 2000s document saying how important jobs were to this community but a cut-off date at 2011 and an obvious cliff edge at that stage. The plant, well, the plant was uh, with three identified businesses which were going to occupy the site, and they were headquartered or had close relationships to the adjacent business park. Their business was extrusion manufacturing, 
So this is essentially producing it's a precision process, forcing heated material through a very long machine, and that's obviously requiring a very substantial building, forcing that material through pressure, um, with, with that pressure, essentially to create components for construction. So window frames, door frames, decking, the substance of daily life all around us, and obviously the clear synergies with the construction industry that inspectors um, are aware of when they're trying to determine the outline permissions for housing and so forth. And there was a clear operational need for them to be located adjacent to an existing business park and clear evidence of physical constraint, which meant if they didn't get this permission, they simply wouldn't be able to grow the companies. There were also, because of the manufacturing process and these constraints, considerable lorry movements on and off site to store elements elsewhere, or indeed to carry out other parts of the manufacturing process. For example, to paint these strips uh, before they could be assembled into window frames. So at the outset, I was presented with a case. I was obviously brought in after the application had been refused. And we had a general case which referred to employment case and benefits generally, economic benefits generally, and it was agreed that there was an absence of alternatives within the borough. So working with my specialist team, including a specialist economics witness, we broke this case down into four key pillars, job creation, economic growth, innovation through clustering of businesses, and environmental benefits from the reduced transport movements. And we can see in the decision, um, gratifyingly, the inspector really engaging with that case. And I set out a number of references from paragraph 21 onwards. At the core of the case, anchoring it were the 810 net jobs we would create and the safeguarding of the 100 jobs on site. So that gives you an example in this case of what kind of quantum we were talking about. Whether it needs to be 800 jobs at that level, well, that obviously is going to be determined by the local facts um, and ultimately the, the business in question. But obviously, that gives you an idea of the scale that we were operating at in that case. But what we did was we translated this to local issues. We identified that manufacturing jobs represented a fifth of local jobs and that locally the economy had shrunk by 14% during the course of the pandemic. And we looked in detail at the benefit claimants increases, the changes in respect of unemployment, in particular amongst younger people who might benefit from a job on the site, looking at 8% unemployment rate amongst those 18 to 24. And so we see in the decision the inspector engaging with that, saying, uh, identifying a very considerable contribution to sustaining this area's primary employment sector by manufacturing, and improving its longer term resilience in terms of productive productivity and employment. Large part of our case was that we could build this quickly, but this would create further benefits uh, over a longer range of time if they got started now. So effectively tying that into the local plan position, saying we've got no evidence here that the local plan is going to be adopted any time in the next few years. If we have to wait for this process, that means that every single person will benefit from a job on this site We'll have to wait for this authority to catch up. Um, I, I continue, paragraph 30, 23. We also try to diversify the, uh, the aspects of the employment and the uh, socioeconomic benefits, talking about the retained expenditure, looking at how local people, how there was a significant amount of retained employment in the local area, and therefore what that would mean for the local villages surrounding the area. Obviously giving clues to the inspector to drive around it, to look at the quality of the buildings, quality accommodation around that, to see how much this community would benefit from these jobs. We talked about training, apprenticeships. We had documentation from our client explaining his commitment and how someone who'd started out on the shop floor to provide apprenticeships and, and give people a chance to start their career in manufacturing. And we also talked about the social and health benefits. We mined the NHS data in respect of the impacts of deprivation and the impacts of worklessness. Now, by the time we've reached the inquiry, the council wasn't challenging any of these benefits, but it's apparent from the fact that it went to inquiry that that agreement from the council came extremely late in the day, well after the proof of evidence had gone in. And ultimately, um, the, the council did not seek to argue there were any alternatives. But nonetheless, it demonstrates that where you've got political opposition, it's unfortunately not possible to simply strong arm the council into bringing it early on in the appeal process 
however much you're banging your head against the wall, try to get an answer from them on the statement of contract. The inspector also obviously placed a significant weight on the fact that this was not a speculative proposal. And ultimately, bearing in mind our core principle in any appeal work to be inspector focused, think about when it goes before that inspector, what their recent, and often be very recent, for the junior inspectors, as in this case, an inspector of only two years' experience, think about what they've been doing locally, either because they're in the planning policy department or in development control. Appeal to that former planning officer within them. Get them to think about what it was like doing site visits, going on site, you know, reading through statements of that kind, and why they became a planner in the first place. And then translate that economic data to those real stories. So have the economic data, but also then think quite carefully about how you can then source data locally about rates of employment, what it means to the local community, even if you find that people are quite quiet in that community in respect their actual support for the proposal. And fundamentally, get your client to talk about their own track record of building things and building things quickly and effectively. But thirdly, think creatively about issues of co-location, clustering, and other combinations. I referred earlier on to that very sparse text, but this reference that we find to specific locational requirements of different sectors of paragraph 83. How can you make your business, and there are many businesses, frankly, that, that might not obviously present as being knowledge and data driven or high technology, or simply have an ordinary storage and distribution. But ultimately, if you can paint their vision, to expand their business and benefit uh, essentially from better space, modern accommodation, then you can get yourself within that wording of the MPPF. And fundamentally, think about how you can display that creatively. This goes back to my experience at Pinewood. At Pinewood, we put in dozens of plans which set out how a film set operates, why you need that amount of space to drive carts on, bring people on, move the cameras around, all the rest of it. No, I was dealing with a factory which was building window frames, exactly the same principles applied. So we put in the, the plans, we made the inspector think about this, and although we invited the inspector to go on site, and perhaps she might have done, had there not been COVID restrictions, we made clear that that was a, something that was available to her. There are also, in principle, we had some videos as well, the videos inside the factory to make her understand why the building needed to be so high, why so broad, and why so much storage space around those buildings. Fourthly, um, if you can, at all possible, agree the alternative site assessment very early on in the process. And remember that the local authority may be your friend in this respect. The local authority may not wish to identify that there are other sites or uh, sites with obvious constraints as alternatives as part of that process. And certainly not for the development to leave the borough with the obvious um, disadvantages that may come in that respect, bearing on the rivalry inevitably between adjacent boroughs. Fifthly, then, identify your proposed end user. Obviously, if it's someone who is uh, clearly identified, then you know they're going to move in on site. That's a very powerful consideration. But even if you don't have them signed up, work, you know, uh, get extensive agents' letters, um, get letters from prospective occupiers, really build that case to show that if, it, if, if you build it, they will come. Um, whilst Epic Hall is undoubtedly on its facts an unusually strong case, there are some principles there that will be applicable to any, uh, certainly manufacturing case, but also to any employment generation development. I just want to briefly touch upon the call in applications. You can see at paragraph 35 and 36, I've drawn out some key phrases from the Secretary of State's decisions there. They sound very similar, frankly, to what we saw in Denby Hall. In Wigan, employment land supply critically low. An existing policy vacuum on employment land supply. Need particularly stark. In Bolton, substantial planning need, significant local deprivation, unfulfilled inquiries for development. So let's conclude. Every successful appeal or call of application initially and very regrettably begins in the failure of the plan making process. 
And so, as Chris has averted to at the outset, you may wish to rely upon a draft allocation, but you may simply be in a situation where the local plan process has stalled or is it proceeding extremely slowly, far too slowly for those who need a job now within the immediate future. And so, at root, the strength of this VSC case will be in explaining why the existing plan is so out of date to merit departure, or more in a more difficult task, why that emerging develop, why the emerging development plan doesn't provide the answer or won't provide it quickly enough. Uh, Amber Valley, Bolton and Wigan, obviously unusually strong in this respect, the latter is because of what's happening with GMSF and the places of everyone. But these facts may well become replicable in other authorities with older plans over the next few years, particularly where plan making has been put on hold or it's otherwise slowing. Secondly, the strong connecting theme of all of these cases, notwithstanding the abundant economic data and the evidence of need for logistics and so forth, ultimately in each single case, we see an emphasis on the contribution that development would make to local employment, particularly where there are signs of deprivation on employment in the community. Now, whether we can correlate this with the levelling up agenda, obviously will depend upon the clarity with which Mr Gove is prepared to provide. Uh, further policy, PPG, or whatever it is, in respect of levelling up, but plainly there is promising a policy there to essentially provide uh, the promising prospects of that policy being brought forward to provide some kind of hook to emphasise why we need to tackle deprivation or unemployment through granting employment generation of this kind. And thirdly, up to the 39, it's vital in the case to minimise the other basis of objection so that your Greenbelt case is as clear as possible before your inspector, noting, of course, this issue about other harm being part of the balance overall. And if you've got landscape and openness considerations, use those uh, issues you may be facing to your advantage. Try and turn any weaknesses in the case to your advantage by providing extensive landscaping or open space. Think about biodiversity net gain and the context of the environment act that we've got coming up. I think announced today, I've seen from Chris, one of Chris's emails this morning, we get today to say, um, ultimately, think about doing that not just because it's important for openness purposes, but persuading your inspector of the quality of the scheme that you can bring forward and its rapid deliverability. That it's not going to get tied down in reserve matters after a grant of permission. And so, finally, a VSC case, in my view, should be capable of very simple expression. How about intracursal or detail the underlying evidence base? Yes, the benefits must be at scale. They must match local, regional, national needs, and they must be capable of rapid delivery. And obviously, there must be a substantial evidence base behind it. But ultimately, don't think of it from purely from a client perspective, because there will be dozens and dozens of issues which they will want to talk about and put in their evidence. But think about it fundamentally in those stages you've got to go through. What do you want the officer's report to say, very simply, in that limited time available to members? What do you want members to say in the discussion when they're dealing with a very politically controversial uh, issue? How narrow do you want to phrase that case and make sure it's properly palatable, digestible for members, maybe implacably opposed? And if political intervention means that you simply can't get it granted at this stage, Again, think very, very hard about your inspector and ultimately the Secretary of State. And let's just remind ourselves that the case we're talking about, the ones that were called in, all of that evidence concentrated to just a few single paragraphs setting out those pillars of the VSC case. So I go back to the very start. Yes, the policy is sparse, but applying those principles, Get your, get your VSC case down to those single core principles and then think about how you pack the evidence base behind that, drawing on a number of different sources, but ultimately with that narrowness and clarity. That ultimately is the best way to chart the inevitable risk that attaches uh, to promoting VSC case uh, or Greenbelt development at this time. Thank you very much.